Fintech is quite simply the application of technology to the delivery of financial services. However, Fintech as we know it didn't simply spring up out of thin air. It has existed for quite some time. In 1918, the US Federal Reserve Bank established a system of transferring funds through a wire transfer network using Telegraph and Morse code. Before that, transfer of funds between banks could only be done physically by delivery of cash or gold over a substantial distance. That became the first iteration of fintech as we know it. 50 years later, in 1967, the first ATM or automated teller machine was installed at Enfield Branch in North London. This allowed customers to insert into the ATM a paper check in exchange for cash. This characterized the switch from analog to digital financial services and shortly afterwards in the 1970s the world's first digital stock exchange the Nasdaq was launched. This was followed by SWIFT which is a communication protocol between financial institutions facilitating large volumes of cross-border payments. Now this trend continued into the 1980s with the rise of bank mainframe computers, the growth of online banking which caused a shift in how business was done and how financial services were perceived. Fast forward to 1998, PayPal was launched and that gave us a glimpse into what the new era of payments would grow to become. As the world increasingly began to shift online, this became thought of as the second iteration of fintech which culminated in the 2008 global financial crisis. Now what the 2008 crisis brought was the rise and popularity of the fintech startup era as we know it. The lack of trust in the establishment i.e. the banks and financial institutions coupled with the regulatory changes opened up the market to the new entrants which we call fintechs today. So even though it was technically the third iteration of financial technology advancements, the fact that the previous applications all happened within the realm of established incumbents and this new wave of innovation is primarily driven by new age players and startups leads it to be most recognized as fintech 1.0. Now in this period the iPhone was launched spurring global smartphone adoption which meant that mobile devices became the primary means by which people access the internet and other financial services. The blockchain, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency surfaced and went mainstream following the crisis. Mobile and P2P payment solutions like Square, TransferWise and M-Pesa in Africa also took off. Crowdfunding, digital lending, cross-border mobile wallet remittance are a few examples of the innovations that were driven by fintechs in this era and today we have over 300 fintech unicorns with valuations well over a billion dollars. The rise of fintechs in the fintech 1.0 era was predicated on decentralization and disintermediation. Whereas the banks were attempting to own the entire financial value chain, the fintechs were focusing on unbundling financial products and services aiming to deliver the best user and service experience possible. And this has proved to be quite a successful strategy. However, what this has caused is a bit of a fractured customer experience as well. Consumers now have multiple apps and platforms doing several different things which in itself doesn't make for a great experience. As we've seen in the past, these challenges leave room and opportunity for further evolution within the space and today there's talk of fintech 2.0, the new era of rebundling. This is what we'll talk about in today's video so if you're keen then stay tuned. Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Jeremy and if you're new here and haven't yet subscribed, please consider doing so because on this channel, I speak about fintech, digital transformation, personal and career development. As technology evolves, more and more use cases appear for its application within financial services. Fintechs were said to be disrupting the traditional financial services industry because they were unbundling the value chain and setting new standards of user experience and service delivery. Now, this naturally drew consumers to the new digital-led services and also attracted the attention of investors. Now, global fintech funding rose 68% annually to about $210 billion in 2020 alone according to a report by KPMG. Hence, it's evident that the fintech 1.0 companies are doing well and blossoming. The approach of offering targeted solutions to specific customer pain points like micro lending, savings, micro investing, peer-to-peer -peer lending and payments has worked successfully allowing them to put the power back in the hands of consumers giving them optionality and meeting their needs where they are. However, as I mentioned before, this has created a new problem in terms of the 
sheer number of options for financial services and the fact that consumers now have multiple fintech applications, most of which address a singular function in the spectrum of financial services. And this is where Fintech 2.0 comes in. As described in an article by the Forbes Finance Council, the Fintech 2.0 approach centers on what can best be described as rebundling. This entails seamlessly integrating all fintech solutions that customers need to manage their lives and finances in a single place with the intention to save time, stress, and money for the consumers. Now let's just take a step back because it does sound a bit counterintuitive and complex, right? Earlier on, almost every financial product or service was offered by your bank branch. From credit cards, to transfers, to loans, savings, investment products, everything you wanted was in that centralized location as a fully bundled solution. Digital finance came in and a lot of that was unbundled in the name of decentralization or the democratization of financial services so we could achieve higher standards of service and a more wholesome user experience. And now, we're talking about rebundling, which essentially sounds like retracing our steps to the very construct from which we departed. Yes, that is almost exactly what it is. However, this time, it's a rebundling of the newer fintech offerings that are already delivering those higher service standards. And it's already happening right now. You see applications like Chipper Cash, who initially started off as a remittance payment platform, now providing the functionality for purchasing stock. Even banks are beginning to copy and adopt the buy now, pay later model as part of their offering. The average smartphone user has about 80 apps downloaded on their phone, but only use nine apps per day. Of these nine apps, it's likely that financial apps may be three or four, and they use these three or four for everything. So the rebundling is definitely going to be in line with consumer behavior already. Additionally, one entity that will definitely support this next phase of fintech will be the regulators and policymakers. Now, fintechs have been quite a struggle for them to regulate already, since we know that regulators typically aren't the quickest to adopt policy to industry changes. Add to that the whole aspect of decentralization and it's harder for them to create tailored regulations for each new fintech solution. However, with rebundling comes greater centralization within which regulators prefer to operate already. And given how heavily scrutinized the financial services industry is from a regulatory standpoint, having the regulator on your side definitely will be a plus in advancing the evolution of fintech. Aligned with the thinking of rebundling is the expected rise of neo super apps. This is already quite widespread in places like China, and quickly spreading to other parts of the world. In China, for example, WeChat is the definitive super app within which users are able to do everything from book a taxi, send messages, buying products, and inquiring about banking services. I believe the equivalent of that would be WhatsApp integrating a number of fintech solutions seamlessly into its messenger platform and allowing users the ability to perform a range of financial related tasks from within the app. There are already 2 billion active users of WhatsApp worldwide, and it's used as the most popular messaging service in over 100 countries. People have already built a lot of trust for the platform and you can find a lot of people sending pictures or attachments of their bank statements to others using the app. This will translate seamlessly into the realm of financial services and if done correctly, combining services which used to be spread over several apps into one should be a hit with consumers because of the convenience it presents. What is ultimately required for Fintech 2.0's success is essentially customer-centric thinking. It's about recognizing all of the customer's needs and pain points and finding a way to meet them holistically with minimal friction. In order to do this, we will need to leverage on data to learn and adapt effectively to customers' changing needs. Fintechs already have the edge here and need to continuously develop more advanced solutions in tandem with evolving times. I hope you enjoyed this video. Video. And if you did, remember to hit the like button and leave me a comment. I'm keen to hear what your thoughts are on the future of fintech. And as always, if you want to grab your African print outfits at a discount, the link will be in the description. Have an amazing week and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.